Hello, and welcome back to First Chapter Friday. This is Miss Mary at the Dutcher Middle School Library, and today we are going to be reading uh, from Patricia McCormick's Sold. We are doing this because January is National Slavery and Human Trafficking Month. It is during this month that we raise awareness about human trafficking in the hopes to increase detection and to identify victims. So what is human trafficking? Human trafficking involves the use of force, fraud, or coercion to obtain some type of labor or commercial sex act. Every year, millions of men, women, and children are trafficked worldwide, including right here in the United States. It can happen in any community, and victims can be any age, race, gender, or nationality. Traffickers might use violence, manipulation, or false promises of well-paying jobs or romantic relationships to lure victims into trafficking situations. In 2010, the Homeland Security created the Blue Campaign to help educate law enforcement and the general public about the signs, causes, and impact of human trafficking on individuals and communities. If you'd like to learn more, I have put a link to their website in the video description below. If you or someone you know are in need of help, please call the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888 or text INFO to BE FREE. As I said earlier, today's reading is going to be of Patricia McCormick's novel Sold, which deals with human trafficking in Nepal and India. It is written in vignettes, which are short descriptive scenes, uh, so it doesn't have chapters. So we're going to just read the first ten entries of the novel. And without further ado, let's begin. A Tin Roof One more rainy season and our roof will be gone, says Ama. My mother is standing on a log ladder inspecting the thatch and I am on the ground handing the laundry up to her so it can bake dry in the afternoon sun. There are no clouds in sight, no hint of rain, no chance of it for weeks. There is no use in telling Amma this, though. She is looking down the mountain at the rice terraces that descend step by step to the village below, at the neighbor's tin roofs winking cruelly back at her. A tin roof means that the family has a father who doesn't gamble away the landlord's money playing cards in the tea shop. A tin roof means the family has a son working at the brick kiln in the city. A tin roof means that when the rains come, the fire stays lit and the baby stays healthy. Let me go to the city, I say. I can work for a rich family like Kita does and send my wages home to you. Ama strokes my cheek, the skin of her work-worn hand as rough as the tongue of a newborn goat. Lakshmi, my child, she says. You must stay in school, no matter what your stepfather says. Lately, I want to tell her my stepfather looks at me the same way he looks at the cucumbers I'm growing in front of our hut. He flicks the ash from his cigarette and squints. You had better get a good price for them, he says. When he looks, he sees cigarettes and rice beer, a new vest for himself. I see a tin roof. Before Gita left. We drew squares in the dusty path between our huts and played the hopping on one leg game. We brushed each other's hair a hundred strokes and dreamed of names for our sons and daughters. We pinched our noses shut whenever the headman's wife passed by, recalling the time she broke wind strutting past us at the village spring. We rubbed the rough edged notch in the school bench for good luck before a recitation. We threw mud at each other during the long afternoons stooped over in the patties and wept with laughter when one of Gita's mud pies hit her haughty older sister in the back of the head. And in the fall, when the goat herds came down from the Himalayan meadows, we hid in the elephant grass to catch sight of Krishna, the boy with sleepy cat eyes, the one I am promised to in marriage. Now that Gita is gone to work as a maid for a wealthy woman in the city, her family has a tiny glass sun that hangs from a wire in the middle of their ceiling, a new set of pots for Gita's mother, a pair of spectacles for her father, a brocaded wedding dress for her older sister, and the school fees for her little brother. Inside Gita's family's hut, it is daytime at night. But for me, 
It feels like nighttime even in the brightest sun without my friend. The new student. Each morning as I go about my chores, straining the rice water, grinding the spices, sweeping the yard, my little black and white speckled goat tally follows at my heels. That silly goat, Alma says. She thinks you are her mother. Tali nudges her head into the palm of my hand and bleats in agreement. And so I teach her what I know. I wipe the hard mud floor with a rag soaked in dung water and explain, this will keep our hut cool and free from evil spirits. I show her how I lash a water jug to the basket on my back, not spilling a drop on the steep climb up from the village spring. And when I brush my teeth with a twig from the neem tree, Tally copies me, nibbling her twig as solemn as a monk. When it's time for me to go to school, I make her a bed of straw in a sunny corner of the porch. I kiss her between the ears and tell her I'll be home in time for the midday meal. She presses her moist pink nose into the pocket of my shirt, searching for a bit of stowaway grain, then settles down, a jumble of elbows and knees burrowing into the straw to nap. What a funny animal, Alma says. She thinks she is a person. Alma must be right, because one day last week, when I was sitting in the schoolroom, I heard the tinkling of her bell and looked up and saw my little speckled goat wandering around the schoolyard, bleeding in despair. When, finally, she spotted me through the window, she bad, with wounded pride, indignant at being left behind. She marched across the yard, propped her hooves up on the window sill, and looked in with keen and curious eyes as the teacher finished the lesson. When school is over and we climb the hill toward home, Tally trotted ahead, her stubby tail held high. Next week, I promised her, we will work on our spelling. Something Beautiful In the morning, Alma bends down to stir the kitchen fire and to plait my hair before I go to school. All day, as she trudges up and down the mountain, a heavy basket braced on her back and held fast by a rope around her brow, she is bent under the weight of her burden. And at night, as she serves my stepfather his dinner, she kneels at his feet. Even when she is standing upright to scan the sky for rain clouds, my Amma's back is stoked. The people who live on our mountain, a cluster of red mud huts clinging to the slope, worship the goddess who lives there on the swallow-tailed peak. They pray to the goddess whose brow is fierce and noble, whose breast is broad and bountiful, whose snowy skirt spread wide above us. She is beautiful, mighty, and magnificent. But my Amma, with her crow-black hair braided with bits of red rag and beads, her cinnamon skin and her ears hung with the joyful noise of tinkling gold, is to me more lovely. And her slender back, which bears our troubles and all our hopes, is more beautiful still. The Difference Between a Son and a Daughter my stepfather's arm is a withered and useless thing. Broken as a child when there was no money for a doctor, his poor mangled limb pains him during the rainy months and gives him great shame. Most of men his age leave home for months at a time, taking jobs at factories or on work crews far away, but no one, he says, will hire a one-armed man. And so he oils his hair, puts on his vest, and a wristwatch that stopped towing time long ago and goes up the hill each day to play cards, talk politics, and drink tea with the old men. Amma says we are lucky we have a man at all. She says I am to honor and praise him, respect and thank him for taking us in after my father died. And so I act the part of the dutiful daughter. I bring him his tea in the morning and rub his feet at night. I pretend I do not hear him joining in the laughter when the men at the tea shop joke about the difference between fathering a son and marrying off a daughter. A son will always be a son, they say, but a girl is like a goat, good as long as she gives you milk and butter, but not worth crying over when it's time to make a stew. Beyond the Himalayas At dawn, our hut, perched high on the mountainside, is already torched with sunlight, while the village below remains cloaked in the mountain's long purple shadow until mid-morning. By midday, the tawny fields would be dotted with the cheerful dresses of the women, red as the poinsettias that lace the windy footpaths. Napping babies will sway in wicker baskets, and lizards will sun themselves outside their holes. In the evening, the brilliant yellow pumpkin blossoms will close, drunk on sunshine, 
while the milky white jasmine will open their slender throats and sip the chill Himalayan air. At night, low herbs will send up wispy curls of smoke fragrant with a dozen dinners, and darkness will clothe the land. Except on nights when the moon is full. On those nights, the hillside and the valley below are bathed in a magical white light, the glow of the perpetual snows that blanket the mountain tops. On those nights, I lie restless in the sleeping loft, wondering what the world is like beyond my mountain home. Calendar. At school there is a calendar where my young moon-faced teacher marks off the days with a red crayon. On the mountain we mark time by women's work and women's woes. In the cold months, the women climb high up on the mountain's spine to scavenge for firewood. They take food from their bowls, feed it to their children, and silence their own churning stomachs. This is the season when the women bury the children who die of fever. In the dry months, the women collect basketfuls of dung and pat them into cakes to harden in the sun, making precious fuel for the dinner fire. They tie rags around their children's eyes to shield them from the dust blowing up from the empty riverbed. This is the season when they bury the children who die from the coughing disease. In the rainy months, they patch the crumbling mud walls of their huts and keep the fire going so that yesterday's gruel can be stretched to make tomorrow's dinner. They watch the river turn into a thundering beast. They pick leeches from their children's feet and give them tea to ward off the loose bowel disease. This is the season when they bury the children who cannot be carried to the doctor on the other side of that river. In the cool months, they prepare special food for the festivals. They make rice beer for the men and listen to them argue politics. They teach the children who have survived the seasons to make back-to-school ink from the blue-black juice of the marking nut tree. This is also the season when the women drink the blue-black juice of the marking nut tree to do away with the babies in their wombs, the ones who would be born only to be buried next season. Another calendar. According to the number of notches in Amma's wedding trunk, she is 31, and I am 13. If my baby brother lives through the festival season, Amma will carve a notch for him. Four other babies were born between me and my brother. There are no notches for them. Confession Each of my cucumbers has a name. There is a tiny one, Muthi, which means size of a handful. Muthi gets the first drink of the day. Nearby is Yeti the biggest one named for the hairy snow monster. Yeti grows so fat, little Muthi cowers under a nearby leaf in fear and awe. There is Anata, the one shaped like a snake, and Baja, the gnarled grandmother of the group. Vishnu, as sleek as rain, and Nazma, the ugly one named for the headman's wife. There is one named for my hen, and three for her chicks, one for Gita, and one for Ganesh, the elephant god, remover of obstacles. I treat them all as my children, but sometimes, if my water jug runs low, I scrimp a bit on Nazma. First Blood I awoke today before even the hen had begun to stir, aware of a change in myself. For days I have sensed a ripening in my body, a tender, achy feeling unlike anything I felt before. And even before I go to the privy to check, I know that I have gotten my first blood. Amma is delighted by my news, and sets about making the arrangements for my confinement. You must stay out of sight for seven days, she says. Even the sun cannot see you until you've been purified. Before the day can begin, Amma hurries me off to the goat shed, where I will spend the week shut away from the world. Don't come out for any reason, she says, and if you must use the privy, cover your face and head with your shawl. At night, she says, when your stepfather has gone out and the baby has gone to sleep, I will return, and then I will tell you everything you need to know. And that is the end of today's reading of Sold by Patricia McCormick. It is available as always, from the Dutch Middle School Library for checkout if you want to know more about Lakshmi's story. If you or someone you know is in need of help um, dealing with 
issues of human trafficking, um, please call the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888 or text INFO to be free or check out the uh, Homeland Security Blue Campaign page for more information. As always, thank you for listening in to First Chapter Friday, and I hope you have a great weekend.